What's up, C Mask viewers? We're back with a special episode for you today on Armageddon. It's Nick, Mike, Will, and myself. And we are talking today about a comment that Cardinal Burke tweeted out. It's been something I've been commenting on recently, and actually, even before I saw his tweet on Armageddon and Times. I had decided to offer on timothyjgordon.com a class specially on the book of the apocalypse. I have I have someone else teaching it. I just decided to do that a week or two ago because as St. Paul says in the Bible, who can't read the signs of the times? I mean, Jesus says no man knows the hour that the end times will come, but he also says who can't uh, St. Paul also says in inerrant scripture who, who cannot read the signs of the times? And just to speak in terms of semblances for a second, it seems, semblance, pretty obvious that things are coming apart, that the, the cracks on the wall are starting to grow. Cardinal Burke tweeted this about this time of the day yesterday. He said, are these the last times? I don't know that. Our Lord himself said that it is for the Father to make these decisions, of course. But it certainly seems that way. So he's speaking in terms of semblance as well. And so we need a strong intervention from our Lord, and we're begging Our Lady to intercede on our behalf. Then he urges everyone to join, join a nine-month novena to Our Lady today, and you can go on novena.cardinalburke.com. I want to shout out to him. But Will, then Nick, then Mike, I, I'd just like you guys to take an opening shot at whether or not it seems like end times, um, so much so that I even, like I said, I started offering this class before I heard him say this, I also would just say as part of my opening shot, I never really get the disposition where we're supposed to try to forestall it. One of my favorite books is Father Elijah, for example, by Michael D. O'Brien. And the whole premise of the book is attempting to forestall the end times. I realize that the end times are rough on the true believers and the, the people of goodwill, Christians. But I mean, should we really flee from the end times? Cardinal Burke says um, we need a strong intervention from our Lord. We're begging Our Lady in, to intercede on our behalf. I simply, as a, as a man who's somewhat studied in this area, I don't understand why we need intercession. I mean, if this is providence or times to, to come to an end about now, I mean, why not just say, hey, everybody go to confession and communion, get yourself right with the Lord and prepare for it. Why flee from it? Will, you don't have to answer that, neither does Nick or Mike. That's a kind of a rhetorical question. I don't get why we reflexively say, let's try to put off the end times. Will, what do you have? In answer to that question, I think it's because even amongst Christians, including many trad Catholics, the secular liberal worldview that Life is just never-ending progress, and the future is golden, bright, and shining. That's so deeply baked into us that the idea that it's just a slow, gradual defeat and things slowly get worse is almost intolerable to them psychologically. Tolkien wrote that because he was a Christian, he had come to terms with the fact that history is exactly that, slow, gradual defeat. And the end times are coming. And if you're alive during them, then that's how Providence decided that things should be. And you have to accept it. It's futile to resist it. Does it seem that we are in the end times? Yeah, you could argue for sure that it seems that way. I was really struck by a remark that Aquinas makes in his commentary on the second letter to the Thessalonians. And he says that the end times will be characterized by unashamed sodomy. Now, if you just look around you in popular culture today, it certainly doesn't look like that isn't happening. So that's one thing to tick off. And what does it actually mean? The fact that that is so prevalent and clear. It's a rejection of the social kingship of Christ because whole societies, just like individuals, uh, duty and honor bound to actually institute and live out God's laws. When you don't do that, what are you showing? Especially as a, a society that used to be a Christian, it's uh, rejection. 
rejection of the truth and the great apostasy is another sign of the end times. And it's difficult to see how much more evidence people would want of that in all the Western nations than what you're seeing right now. Like, What would it take for you to think, oh, I, I can see that. I can see it right now. What do you say, Nick? I'm reminded of Matthew 24 because, <clears throat> you know, Will, Will brings up the unashamed sodomy and then I started trying to tick off in my head the other things that we're told are going to happen. And it's, you know, uh, take take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. It's like, that's happening. It's been happening for a little while, but the, the more, like, whispers of wars as opposed to actual wars has totally been happening. Um you know, many false prophets shall rise, uh, iniqui iniquity shall abound. Um, but then I get like this, like allergic reaction to me doing exegesis because <laughs> it feels very Protestant to say like, well, this is, look, it says it right here. So that means it's happening. Like I have no idea, obviously, if it is or or, or isn't. Um, and so I, I sort of, I have two, I fall on, on two sides of this. The first side is, is yours, Tim, which is like, if it is like, just be, do what you're supposed to do. You knowing the end, you know, the end date isn't really going to change what you're supposed to be doing, which is sort of my opinion with like Francis, like, yeah, you should know what's happening, but that doesn't mean you like stop going to church, become Orthodox, obviously. Right. Um, but then on the other side, you had um, Chad the Rip Ripperger on yesterday, two days ago, and uh, he has a very good series. Uh, it's like a five-part series on um, basically what virtues you need to accrue in the end times, or at least during the Great Chastisement. And I, th I think the the premise that he's putting forth is simply that not that you can forestall it. He never, he never says that that's a, a reasonable thing to do, but that if you're going to go through it, basically nobody has sufficient virtue to not suffer egregiously during that time. And so if you do want to like not be in hell on earth, because you're not going to have food, you're not going to have electricity, it's like there's going to be suffering that nobody's ever experienced. Then he's like, well, then you should probably brush up on like this set of virtues so that you don't like hate every second that at least the chat. I think he's mostly talking about the chastisement, but I don't know if the chastisement's different than is Carl Burke talking about the start of the apocalypse or is he talking about the chastisement? Cause the chastisement you can forestall. Mary said you could like petition her and she's the only one who could forestall the chastisement. Do you know which one he's talking about? Yeah, I think it's all Are we talking about the there. second coming. Like the second coming of Christ, is that what we're talking about too? Like the end times and this whole pre millennium, a millennium, post millennium conversation. Yeah, the whole the whole ball of yarn from from the Book of Revelation, and there's not there's not an Catholic eschatology that is comprehensive. Um, there's there's not a lot of teach the the most teachings actually on the Book of the Apocalypse, the Book of Revelation, is. It's relatively scant, and that's why I was offering a course on it. People go to timothyjgordon.com. Um, Andrew Orozco is is um, running this course for me starting in October, spooky Halloween month. There's there's not a, a whole lot of teaching on it. It's kind of like um, kind of like limbo, where where it's it's if you check what's actually shored up about uh, the the end times. It, it yeah, it that term, the end times or last times, which is actually the the way that um, Colonel Burke termed it, last times. There's yeah, that includes all of um, the Catholic period from the beginning of what what you know Protestants call the tribulation. Um, obviously, skipping the rapture because that's fake um, through through the, the the general judgment of our Lord on the world, uh, Mike. Uh, there's something I want to say to well, one of Will's points, but um, uh, what, what do you think of this first, Mike? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't get too wrapped up in the whole conversation. I see you see a lot of this discussion on on Twitter, and there's these some of these this absolutely intolerable big accounts that are talking about this false awakening and people are getting red pilled and it's a sign of the times to come. And I think a lot of these people, I'm not saying this to Cardinal Burke necessarily. I think we should all pray, but I just go out inside and touch grass because I already know that uh, Christ, Christ is one, like he sits on the throne victorious. So I don't really get too wrapped up in the conversation of, you know, pre a post or the end times. I mean, they think it's very clear, at least to me, it's like, if it's not the end times and maybe we're witnessing a societal, a, you know, a collapse of civilization, um, kind of like how St. Paul, uh, wrote that epistle to the Romans and we're living in a reprobate society, you know, the unhinged sodomy and Skittles culture and the transformers and, and all that going on. Obviously there's something happening. There's something happening spiritually. I mean, it's clearly like the, the demonic realm is working overtime on people's souls to, to, to drag them astray. But I think, the, I think the one thing to be focused on is okay. Yeah. Be attentive to what's happening. Cause there's going to be a separating of like the wheat and the chaff. But for me and for my family, it's, it's all about, us getting right with God, going to confession frequently, trying to accrue and grow in virtue, um, getting right with God. So whenever this chastisement or the end times come, then, you know, you're hopefully um, in the right place. I just think there's a lot of this doomer decline stuff happening. And I don't think it matters that much because I know God is one. He scoffs at the attempts of the enemy. So what do we have to truly worry about? Whether it's societal collapse or end times. Yeah, this is sort of this is sort of my point that that I was making to Will and and you, Mike. I can respond um, in kind. I I understand there will be suffering, and and there's the the end times are are kind of nasty, but for those of us who are really really close with our families, who I think is all of us, I've always thought it's a. I mean, people people will say this is naive, but I. I'm a, I'm a person who can undergo suffering. Like I, the real Christians can undergo suffering. I'd rather undergo sufferings jointly with my family. And then we kind of all expire together rather than um, undergoing suffering unto death severally and, and going up to particular judgment at various times, particularly with my wife. And, and kids. So I don't, I just don't share the view that even if it, it, it entails a little add extra suffering, that it's that's something that should be fled from. And um, the, like I said, the premise of the book, Father Elijah, is that I guess this comes down to us from holy tradition. It's based on the Soloviev book, uh, The Antichrist, really loosely. And, and that book is based on early Christian tr tradition. Soloviev was a Orthodox who converted to Catholicism. And the book's called The Antichrist, <clears throat> which I might have said. But um, the idea is that you, you want to work to gain the boon from heaven of more time for the theological reason that in the end times, so few have the faith. Like Jesus says, when the Son of Man returns, will he find any faith left on earth? So you want to strive to find more faith. Uh, to to generate more faith among you know the apostatized, and therefore more souls will go to heaven. So okay, well there's a theological um, motive for expanding the life of the world. I get it, but if Jesus really, if he if he prophesied correctly, which of course he did, that when he comes back, not many will have faith. Then it just becomes a, a sort of zero sum game where okay, so if you expand the life of the world by evangelizing extra or whatever the plot of um, Father Elijah involves avoiding the coming of the Antichrist because he is a man of free will up into a certain point. Well, then, okay, you expand the life of the world by 100 or 200 years, but Jesus prophesied correctly anyway. And by the time he comes back 100 or 200 years later, the faith will have fallen away again. At some point, he has to come. I'm just doing the, the arithmetic. Jesus has to come. And because he said that when he comes back, there will be very, very little faith on earth, whether it's the first time that the Antichrist might have arisen or the second time or the third time, eventually he's got to come back and find really only a very small, uh, a very scant, scarce number of the elect. So what? why does it, isn't it arbitrary to try to expand the, the time frame? 
there's some good paragraphs on this in the catechism 675 to 677 i just got them up here because people might not have read them but they go like this uh, basically the point is that the the church as the mystical body of christ must go through a passion just like christ did and here are a couple of quotes before yep. Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. So similar to what Tim was saying there, you shouldn't be surprised if things get far worse than they are even now, because that's what we've been told is going to happen. And then catechism continues, the church will enter the glory of the kingdom only through this final Passover when she will follow her Lord in his death and resurrection. So that final Passover is necessary. There's no avoiding it. Don't try to escape it. There will be a final unleashing of evil before God's triumph at the last judgment, after the final cosmic upheaval of this passing world. Again, the final unleashing of evil. Is that related to the rejection of the social kingship of Christ? And things like the legalization of abortion and gay marriage, I think so. And then St. Pope Gregory the Great has some good comments on this whole area. In his commentary, uh, Moralia and Job, it, Moralia and Job, he says, signs of power are withdrawn from holy church, right? So the church is going to look weak as part of this. So anybody who is looking at the signs of power withdrawn from the church and thinking that's a reason not to be Catholic or not to stay Catholic. You've got things upside down. It's exactly what the church teaches is going to happen. And why is it a good thing? How is it all part of God's plan? And this speaks to Tim's point, I think. So catechism says that it's so that the divine mercy and justice may be fulfilled together by one and the same means. And here's how it's actually a good thing that you might be living through the last times right now. Uh, it increases the reward of those who continue to reverence the church when she is abject because, I'm quoting here, they do so not on account of present signs, but for the hope of heavenly things. So you right. can increase your reward, right? There's a chance to earn greater merit, greater rewards in eternity right now because of how bad the times you're living through are. And on the other hand, this is what's so amazing. Meanwhile, the mind of the wicked is the more quickly displayed against her because the lack of visible signs means they neglect to pursue the invisible things which she promises. It's like when the grass is cut, the snakes show. So it works for the benefit on both sides. Draws out, punishes the wicked, but also helps the good to earn more merit. So why would you not want that to be the case? And I think there's this human desire to always put a label on something in order to gain some kind of relief. I think what we lack so much of is the, the ability to exist in the tension of the unknowing or the unknown. And I think this is a reason a lot of people become state of a contest. They don't know how to sit in the tension of Francis being Pope and what's going on in the church. They see this like smoke of Satan that Paul VI alluded to, and they immediately want to put themselves in the seat to kind of give themselves some sort of spiritual relief, not you know, in, a, in a, an attempt to understand and yeah, to relieve their their minds or their spirits or their emotional state or whatever. And I think it's the same thing with trying to understand if we're in the end times or not. Like for me, it's kind of irrelevant. Just like Francis was completely irrelevant in me returning to the church. It's like, okay, I know this is where the truth lies. It's not going to be perfect. It's maybe got a skin problem, but everything underneath that flesh surface, like it's all there. The truth is there. The heart, the soul, the the lungs are all perfectly working. Um, and the, obviously, the world is in is in disarray. But I just I don't know. I don't I don't see the utility in, in hyper focusing on these things. And that's why my my whole thing is getting right with God and making sure my family gets right with God. So if this happens. We're good. We're on the right side of eternity. And I think it's it's orienting yourself toward eternity. So anything that happens, the suffering and the chastisement that comes is just all part of it anyways. And it's like good for you. Cardinal, yeah, Cardinal Burke, just to expand the context a bit, has given a couple addresses at the Rome Life Forum 
over the last seven years since since um the the centennial of Fatima two I think two different times it might be three where he has quoted um Our Lady of Akita which is broadly seen even by um Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger as the conceptual expansion the sequel if you will of Fatima the the um the apparitions of Our Lady to Sister Agnes Sasagawa at Akita Japan in 1973 the message there is pretty clear that the apostasy, the great apostasy of the end times, will begin at the tippy top of the church. Um, Sister Agnes didn't say tippy top, but said at the at the apex of the church. Cardinal Burke has been keen on this point that it will begin at the top. Uh, just yesterday, Francis said this to school children in Singapore. All religions are paths to reach God. I mean, can, I'd say, can you believe this? But it's been 11 years of this filth. They are, to make a comparison, like different languages, different dialects to get there. But God is God for everyone. If you were to start uh, to fight saying, my religion is more important than yours, mine is true and yours isn't, where will this lead us? There is only one God, and each of us has a language to arrive at God. Some are sheikh. Muslim, Hindu, Christians, there are different ways to God. So um, d d now, true, I, I think when you have a pope saying this, this is apostasy, by the way. I mean, this I've said this a few times in the Francis pontificate. He also delivered um, an interview to um, the 90-plus-year-old editor of uh, La Repubblica newspaper in Rome, who was his best friend, atheist, Eugenio Scalfari saying Jesus uh, was not part of the Trinity while he was a man. So he, you know, they never, the Vatican never redacted that. That's, that's uh, apostasy as well. But this quote by Francis of religious syncretism and indifferentism, the, basically the Masonic view of religion in a nutshell, if it's from a Pope, if he's, if he's actually Pope, I would say it has to be, it has to be, last times you know this thing he just said it was actually two days yeah. ago and now and there's a there's a you know we always find out um the, the church's decree on a pontificate whether this was a pope or an anti-pope after the fact um so and the, the roman ordinarium doesn't even agree with itself on how, how many anti-popes we've had we've had between 30 and 40 for some reason we can't get the exact number it's not as precise as we would like it to be but the point is yeah there there is this significant chance um you know, where we, I don't know where you guys are all at, at on Francis, but there's a real chance, a non zero chance that he's just anti, an anti pope. We, we get about one per century, one and a half per century. So there's that. That's kind of the simple explanation. But if somehow he doesn't turn out to be an anti pope, I'm open to either way, then he's just saying things like Jesus wasn't part of the Trinity and, and um, all religions are like different dialects and there, there aren't false faiths. Then um, it's it's got to be end times. But and, and Cardinal Burke is keen on this point. It, 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 so I don't know what do you guys think of that kink in this whole thing. I'd like to offer an even more black pilled perspective and <laughs> see if you guys <laughs> agree with it or not. Um, I, right. I really like what. <laughs> yeah, here we go. I really like what awesome. Mike said about um, the discomfort that people have in the present moment with the tension and my eyes looked over to again matthew 24 and verse 3 and he sat upon the mount of olives and the disciples came up to him privately saying tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world and it just sort of struck me that so like two thousand years ago you had basically the same people like on twitter just being like so is it is it happening right now and you know, un unashamed sodomy. It's like, okay, so we have the city of Sodom and that was destroyed, but that was, you know, a few thousand years ago. And then the apostles are asking Jesus, like, this has got to be soon, right? And then you have 1,848 years and you have the Seneca Falls Convention. And then I'm sure there are people after that happened, they're like, women politicians, like women voting, women working, like 
this must be our undoing. And then I just saw this morning, it was like 1960s, there was a clip of uh, British women and they were being shown a dress that had like a low cut and they were being interviewed. Like, what do you think of this dress? And they're like, I would never wear such a thing. Like mm -hmm. no woman with any self-respect would wear such a thing. And then you get, you know, the Obama presidency and like the codification of my, my point being is since pre COVID, I have been astonished that we keep going. People keep saying there's going to be an economic collapse. Our national debt's too high. Since I was a child, my, our national debt has been too high and we are going to go into an economic collapse. My sort of black pilled take is I don't think it's even close to as bad as it's going to be when it's the end times. I agree with that. I think if we think so, I think we've underestimated the depths of human depravity. And that's what I'm worried about. So. Mm -hmm. The thing that has been consistently disappointing to me is is just how far away the bottom is. It seems like we can just keep falling. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to see the um and this yeah, it's so frustrating with some of the and I, I love the zeal and I've got tremendous zeal as well, and I gotta temper it because it becomes hubris rather quickly, but these zoomers catholics that are all over twitter and social media like pope's planning endlessly 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 it's like i think that's like just as bad as the people that just deny the pope all, outright i just don't know how you pope's playing your way out of the comment like that i didn't even i didn't really fully realize what he said there that's a difficult one to hear great point yeah nick. i don't sorry very well that was a great point from nick and you can think about the level that the sexual degeneracy of the Roman Empire reached. And it was far worse than what we have around us now. And it might just be that the end times are a much longer period of time than a lot of people are willing to, to stomach. And it will just be a very slow and gradual descent. And a lot of it will be characterized by just like boredom to almost becoming used to it. So you're no longer shocked anymore and numbing. I think that's a really profound insight. And this still, it doesn't change ultimately what the response is. So the Christians living in the Roman Empire, what did they do? Well, they looked after their kids. They had the home as like a mini ark and they just slowly pulled through. Whether it's the end times or not, you have to act in the same way. It reminds me a bit of the hot gates and the Spartans and the Persians say that they'll blot out the sun with the arrows. And the Spartans are like, okay, I guess we'll fight in the dark. And that's it. You do the same thing, whether it's dark or not. Um, I would say I, I would. I agree. Like sexual licentiousness can always get worse, and so um, you can always look at or, or approximate where you think we are on the spectrum, and say, "Oh, it could get so much worse." But, um. I don't know. There's a lot of Calvinism and preoccupation with sex stuff that's stolen into Catholicism the last yep. 10 years. And I, I don't use sex or, or, or even sexual licentiousness as the ultimate litmus test. I think I think the main litmus test is the apostasy from the top. Yeah, I'm judging by Marian apparitions of uh, the last 300 years. Um but yeah, so let me let me read let me substantiate the last comment I made. I mean, when the Pope is we've never we've had bad popes, right? We've had popes that side children, we've had like allegedly raper popes, we've had Borgias. We've never had a pope that um that 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 is an apostate to the faith that says Jesus isn't in the Trinity or or whatever. Francis is uh, the new deal. I don't harp about I, I harp about this mainly on my channel, even then it's just gotten old at this point. But I've, I've spent a lot of the last six years talking about this is sui generis. This is next level. This is a distinction of kind, not a distinction of degree among problematic popes, Francis. So I say Pope Francis is the tell that it's probably got to be at least some some beginning of the last age. I don't know how long the last age will last. Maybe it'll be 200 years. But Cardinal Burke, who instigated all this with his his tweet yesterday, says said this this is um i think this is 2017 so this would be the centennial 
of Fatima at the Rome Life Forum. A few days ago at the Rome Life Forum, Cardinal Raymond Burke gave a compelling address on the secret of Fatima and a new evangelization calling for a consecration of Russia. Remember, Pope Francis actually did the consecration of Russia for, for, for people that know about Fatima out there. We're still not sure if it's valid. There have been seven attempts now to consecrate Russia, which Mary said is bound up in the end of the life of the world. This consecration in recognition of the importance with Russia continues to have in God's plan for peace and, and a sign of profound love for our brothers and sisters in Russia. Um, is the, uh, let me see. I thought he talked about the apostate. To, he said... John Paul II said, you know, on May 25th, 1984, when he sort of failed to consecrate Russia, um, today, once again, we hear the call of Our Lady of Fatima to consecrate Russia to her Immaculate Heart in accord with her explicit instruction. For those who don't know, the second secret of Fatima is that Russia would be evil and spread the errors like feminism and Marxism around the world during most of the 20th century, but then would come full circle and would have some it sounded like positive influence on the world thereafter. Um, the third secret of Fatima, of course, was basically hidden and is unknown, but through the um, apparition of Our Lady uh, 46 years after Fatima at the, uh, the apparition at Akita in 1973, basically told the message that Pope John XXIII concealed in 1960 when the third secret of Fatima was supposed to be revealed. And it basically turns out that it's apostasy in the church from the top, basically telling on uh, not just Francis, but pretty much all the post-conciliar popes. If, if there's one post-conciliar pope, pope after the Second Vatican Council that's tried a little bit to be, you know, Catholic, it, it was um, Pope Benedict XVI, and he's, he's even tried to give hints about Akita and Fatima, but... Um, on May 25th, 1984, John Paul II was supposed to consecrate Russia, and um, and the Vatican, uh, uh, what, what's his name, the famous exorcist who did like 80,000 exorcisms. Nick. Amorth? Gabriel yeah, Amorth. Father, Father Gabriel Amorth was sitting near to where... Um, John Paul II was when he was about to go give a speech on May 25th, 1984. And um, right, and he was going to do the consecration and name Russia specifically. Amorth reports that uh, right at the last minute, uh, John Paul II was surrounded by Vatican diplomats and who, who were saying Ost, Ostpolitik, Ostpolitik, which was the Vatican's post conciliar concept on not further alienating. Soviets, Eastern Bloc people, or the Eastern Orthodox Church, particularly the Russian Orthodox Church. And they said, so if you say consecrate Russia to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart, this will alienate them. So famously, on May 25th, 1984, John Paul II became the sixth pope to fail in the 20th century at consecrating Russia because he just consecrated the world to Our Immaculate Heart, which includes Russia. And this is like telling the firefighters, if your house is on fire, yeah, uh, come to Hattiesburg, Mississippi, like the whole city. That no, you need you need direct intervention. I'm referencing all this just because um, there are so many places. All you have to do is look them up. That Cardinal Burke cites Fatima and Akita as having you know the third secret of Fatima, the secret of Akita, having to do with the end of the world. Um, Father Malachi Martin, who, you know, depending on how much, I'm no longer in a position where I tell people you should listen to this or you should listen to that. But if you listen to Father Malachi Martin, who has read The Third Secret, he would always tell Art Bell on Coast to Coast AM, keep your eyes on the skies. That's the secret of Fatima. Uh, it's horrible. It's frightening. Yeah, keep your eyes on the skies. That, that seems to be the secret of Akita. But it has to do with both apostasy and some sort of natural catastrophe. And um, it just, it just sounds, it sounds like we're, we're at the end of the world. That, that's my, I guess that's how I'm weighing in here. Um, I don't know. Uh, Cardinal Burke quotes John Paul II saying, Mary's appeal is not just, uh, is not just for once. Her appeal must be taken up generation by generation in accordance with the ever new signs of the times. 
It must be unceasingly returned to. It must be taken up anew. That's not so helpful. It's more help. I mean, I, I could take the approach you've taken, Mike, where it's like, hey, this is beyond our pay grade. And I basically do every day. But in a show like this, when I'm actually like, okay, there is going to be a historical end of the world. And um, trying to ascertain exactly when it is always does feel silly and futile and way above our pay grade because it is. But I mean, there is a historical fact. There will be one end of the world leading to the general judgment. And that that's just hard to wrap your head around. But it, I mean, somebody has to live at that time when it begins to wrap up, right? Yeah, I'm just not overly concerned about it happening or not in my lifetime. I'm convinced it's not going to. I think it's going to be, I think we haven't seen the bottom. I don't think we're even ever you know, even close to the bottom, like what, what Nick said. Um, there's obviously concern, there con there's concern for it, but I'm again, you know, more concerned with the souls of my family than I'm concerned when this time is going to happen. Um, maybe that's sure. just me willfully putting the pull the pulling the wool over my eyes. Um, but I think both can be can exist at the same time as like being aware, praying for it, but also the priority being placed on your soul and the souls of your family and 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 your loved ones. I mean, um, yeah, I mean that's the extent of which I think about it. Because if you go down the Doomer rabbit hole, I I just think uh, I'm not saying you are. I'm saying some of these guys that I'm referencing on Twitter are not, not Cardinal Burke, but there's some of these bigger pages, and they're they're mainly Protestant, like Donnie Discerned or Donnie Darkened or whatever. I just like had to just like mute that whole page because it's just it's just so bad. Like just go outside, bro. <laughs> you know what I mean? Agreed. Don't don't become a Doomer. Um, mm -hmm. Doom has this broader meaning where it can be destiny, you know, and there is there is a providence, there is a destiny that's foreordained. And then there's doomer in the sense of don't freak out, don't black pill. I yeah. just, I mean, I, I do believe there is an end of the world and all Christians are called to um, a rapprochement with the idea that it could be during their day. It might not be, but it could be. No man knows the hour, like Cardinal Burke says, but um, I don't, yeah, I, I just, I think it could be in our our era. Is is no one with me on the possibility of it being our era here? I mean, it's just um, just as wow. a matter of if we're polling the four of us, who who's who's on what what view of when it'll be. Well, I think I opened with a statement that it's very possible that it might be right now, but I'm just it's not true. sure whether it makes a big practical difference to any of us in terms of how we actually have to live. It's a cool thing in a way to be able to debate and have different takes on statements by Francis or whatever other signs there are around us. But whether it is or it isn't, ultimately, it's just about living virtuously, frequenting the sacraments and just seeing it through because it happens to be the time that we're all living through if it is the end times. There's one thing that I like and that some people might need to hear in the Baltimore Catechism, this was when, oh, uh, 1885, right? In the section on confirmation. And this is for guys who might have been, you know, raised atheist, uh, pagan, whatever, come to Christianity via our content, listening, but haven't been confirmed. This is question 175. Is it a sin to neglect confirmation? It is a sin to neglect confirmation, especially in these evil days when faith and morals are exposed to so many and such violent temptations. Now, that strikes me as a really good practical action point that people could actually focus on. Like, if you're not confirmed now, and it's possible that we are living through the end times, go get confirmed. Like, use all the spiritual armor that's available to you. That's something you can actually do, rather than just sitting at home, spazzing about, worrying about who said what on Twitter. Just to to my other point, though, about not knowing where the bottom is, in 1885, they're saying these, <laughs> these yeah. degenerate evil times, yeah. these <laughs> evil days, like, that's what I mean, like, the, our perception of it is is so skewed, and I you know, Matthew 24 up next to me, and uh, he even says that this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. I'm like, gosh, this I'm so confused on this uh timeline here which is why i was sort of relieved returning to the catholic faith knowing that they say so little on eschatology it's sort of a relief because i'm like i've i've just been confused by protestants for 
years on this subject with the i even did the pre-trib post-trib millennial rapture rabbit hole thing mm -hmm. and kind of didn't arrive with any more clarity besides that every protestant was like making shit up about the end times for like 300 <laughs> years well yeah that's that's what you can end up with with set of vacantism as well like there are some guys who think that the last real pope was in 1130 and ever since then there's been uh, no real pope and you can't even get the valid sacraments today like there's there's nowhere at all to go to and they can't agree on when the last real pope was so there's that I, rabbit hole to go down if you want to or you can just do what we're saying which is practically it doesn't affect your life too much whether you think it is or it isn't you still have to do the same thing of course and i think we're we're literally all in agreement i i know for a fact now because we've all said it several times we all agree practically keep doing the same thing the most practical thing you can do is we we bring a show on patriarchy pretty much every week four out of five weeks even this is a message for for the patriarchs of homes um you know, well, that's what you can really affect. Your household will be well ordered if the man is holy and the leader, and um, and and he's the the priest, prophet, king of the home. Absolutely, that's what you can influence. This shows more openly, nakedly, um, self consciously about or, or this episode, not this show, about speculation because Cardinal Burke speculated, and because um, once again, I. I would say, look at look at what St. Paul says about the people of Corinth. Look at um, look at the Roman Empire before it fell was pretty much embracing sin. The cycle of sin. Look at the the Israelites throughout the Old Testament. I don't think sin's the good measuring stick, and I, I don't think even sexual licentiousness or you know don't don't women wear too tight a pants now or anything. That's that's not how I'm ga gauging this. I'm gauging. Um, by a sui generis measure. I just I just want to get this out there. Having stipulated, I fully agree with all three of you. There's nothing I can do, and this is just speculation. But um, the reason that I believe, I mean, what I've, the case I'm sort of prosecuting here, following Cardinal Burke closely over the last eight or nine years, is um, the measuring stick is not, you know, what how slutty, slutty chicks dress. It's always going to be kind of bad but rather the church and an apostasy from the top. Um, I'm, I'm yep. on um, Return to Tradition, Anthony Stein's um, thing, and he wrote, Vatican just gave more proof of apostasy from the top. He said this in late um, August, a couple weeks ago, when the Vatican officially switched its designation from marking Christ as the beginning of the, the common era, you know, the, the, the year of our Lord, to the BCE designation. I mean, that's the Vatican. That's that's not nothing. If once again, if Francis is Pope and and things like this, then I mean these these are these are um, all I'm saying is there is a ground for saying things are happening now. I think more meaningful things than how slutty chicks dress or how oh. skanky skanky people are. The Vatican right. itself is in pretty much every appreciable way. In a in in low key apostasy, un, in unstated yeah. apostasy, this has never happened before, and so in that sense, you kind of hope for the legitimacy of the church's sake that it is end times, or irrespective of wanting to die at right. the same time as your family. It's just like, well, I hope this is a once in a in a world lifetime world historical event. I don't, I, I don't I hope the church can't go into full scale apostasy then come out of it, then go back into it, then dip out of it. I hope this is, that's my sort of apocalyptic hermeneutic on not just Francis, but the entire post-conciliar church. I guess maybe I'm more, I'm not talking about Benny Plenis. I'm talking about even 1958 set of Econtus. I've never been one. I never will be one, but I'm, I'm more probably sympathetic to those guys. I think I think Anthony Stein is too at Return to Tradition, who who does good work. He's he's not a set of a contest, but I think both he and I are you know open to hearing the um philosophically coherent, even if incorrect, view of set of a contest because let's face it, the church has been in a low key, unstated apostasy since, you know, John the twenty third became Pope.
So yeah. the question you're really interested in, Tim, isn't like how to practically respond to the possibility of the end times. It's whether is what Francis says the clearest sign that we are, in fact, in the end times right now. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, I think I can also steel man Tim's position um, about the preponderance of evidence pointing to this end time and sort of I don't have a dog in this race, so I can I, I think I can argue exactly against what I what I said 10 minutes ago about we we haven't reached the bottom. We don't know what the bottom is by saying um, if you look at Matthew 24, he never mentions sex. He never mentions degeneracy or sodomy or anything like that. Now, I'm, you know, Paul does. I'm not saying it's not part of it. He does talk about abominations and uh, sin, but sex the sins of the flesh are not the worst kinds of sins um they're kind of like the most understandable like dante doesn't put them at the deepest circle of hell for a reason um and so it could be the case that we are roughly as bad as rome was we are roughly as bad as sodom and gomorrah was we are roughly as bad as it was in the days of noah and it's just up to god what he does at sort of the end of each epoch every, every 250 year cycle does he allow the society to collapse under his own weight or does he choose armageddon and it could be the case that the bottom per se is roughly equivalent in each one of these generations or epochs uh you know societal collapses um and we're in another one. And then the question is, is this the one that he chooses to say, okay, that's enough. And then you sort of could start to look at peripheral signs, such as the apostasy of the church um, to be like, no, yeah, this is more likely. And I will say that the the Marian apparitions do lend credence to sort of like an imminence to this, just like talking about Russia and sort of a contemporary setting at Fatima. Um, that doesn't sound like a thousand years away that kind of sounds like within right. a century ish so my main point being could it be the case that the bottom is sort of roughly equivalent each time and this is like a another local minimum and maybe this is the time that god chooses to um say like i've had enough with this nonsense yeah akita is the most satisfying on specific terms so i'll just read that message in a sec but Nick, you said something really important. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the, the theory of the kind of bi bimillennialism that that twice a millennium, once every 500 years, the church has a schism. You know, you had you had um, the Arian heresy about halfway through the first Christian millennium. Then you had the um, the great schism with the Orthodox a thousand years in, then 1500, right after 1500, you have the Protestant um, revolt. And now we have... Um, the whatever you want to call it, the the Vatican II revolt by liberal prelates who run the church and who really are their apotheosis is Francis, who's saying things like Jesus is, wasn't part of the Trinity when he's around. In, in, in Nick, your point was that every you said every two hundred fifty. I'm I'm sticking with the um five hundred years theory to two hundred fifties. Every so often, God has the providence has the choice to be like okay. Remember how in um, <clears throat> Count of Monte Cristo, the Napoleon, the Bonapartists say, remember, history decides who's the traitor and who's the patriot, you know, which side preponderates in a revolution. Same thing in the church. It's not different. It's not much different, people. It's like, okay, we say that the schism was the Arianists four or 500 years in. Because eventually the, the good guys won. But remember the good guys who opposed the Arians, Santa Claus, who, who punched Arius in the face at the Council of Nicaea and um, St. Athanasius, these guys were the one out of five. They say 80% of the world's bishops had been given over to soft Arianism wow. the, way, the way the good guys are now, except it's even starker. So they eventually won out. But my hermeneutic on ecclesial history is if... Providence hadn't given the minority good guys the victory and and the church became fully Arianist, then the church would have had to end right then, you know, 400 years in. But 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 Providence gave the minority good guys the victory. 
same thing 500 years later, 600 years later with the, um, the great schism, same thing 500 years later. Um, remember, the German princes were the majority in Northern Europe, and they pushed the Protestant revolt for their political reasons against the peasants. So I think what we're confronting now is um, a more urgent thing where even the Pope, not just 80% of the bishops, but the Pope together with 95% of the bishops are basically lavender mafiosi. And so it's just starker. It's just less likely that the minority good guys are going to win out. And I think the presupposition is always that if the bad guy Judas bishops, who have appeared before, but now they're appearing with the blessing of the Pope and in greater numbers than 80%. If they win out, then the world has to end because the gates of hell can't prevail against the church. See, I think people have misunderstood and misinterpreted that scripture also in Matthew, that the gates of hell can't uh, prevail against the church. It doesn't mean the bishops can't go bad. We had Judas at the beginning of the times, and we had 80% of the, the world's bishops were Arianists who said Jesus wasn't part of the Trinity. Well, now we have a Pope that joins them, and it's far greater than 80%. I, my view of history is just that um, the, the minority of the bishops are usually the good guys. Most of the bishops are usually Judas's, but history only is allowed to continue if heaven grants the minority um, a miraculous victory. Now, now listen real quick, if you'll permit me, to what Our Lady said to Sister Agnes in 1973 at the foot of Our Lady at the Chapel of the Rosary. The work of the devil will infiltrate even into the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishops against bishops. Cardinal Burke quotes this like every day. The priests who venerate me, the ones who actually love her, will be scorned and opposed by their confers, meaning the majority. Churches and altars sacked. The church will be full of those who accept compromises, and the demon will press many priests and consecrated souls to leave the service of our Lord. There's the apostasy. The demon will be especially implacable against souls consecrated to God. The thought of the loss of so many souls is the cause of my sorrow. If sins increase in number and gravity, there will be no longer pardon for them, meaning the world will just end. Explanation on this last sentence coming in a second. Um, she'd also told Sister Agnes, many men in this world afflict the Lord. I desire to console him, the Lord, to soften the anger of the Heavenly Father. I wish with my son for the souls who will repair by their suffering and the poverty for the sinners and ingrates. As I told you, if men do not repent and better themselves, the Father will inflict a terrible punishment on all humanity. It will be a punishment greater than the deluge, such as one will have never been seen before. Fire will fall from the sky, like um, Father Martin says, and will wipe out a great part of humanity, the good as well as the bad, sparing neither priests nor faithful. The survivors, survivors will find themselves so desolate that they will envy the dead. The only arms which will remain for you will be the rosary and the sign left by my son, I guess, the crucifix. Each day, recite the prayers of the rosary with the rosary, pray for the Pope, the bishops, and the priests. So, I mean, it's scary stuff. And I guess Chilling. this is why, as much as I agree with you guys, that we can't really do anything about it on our own. All we can do is be holy with our families. It is worthy of speculation, I, I would just say. That's chilling. Yeah. Envy the dead. Yeah. That sucks when when holy survivors are said by Our Lady to be envious of the dead. I mean, it's, again, people shouldn't black pill here, but you know, and that your holiness doesn't preclude you from being wiped out from fire from the sky, like faithful and not faithful, just get obliterated. So that's awesome. I wonder if that's then more of like a like a strategy game then like if holiness isn't the thing like should we be reinforcing our roofs <laughs> I, or not though i'd rather it. be faithful i'd rather be faithful and struck with a fireball and die than like faithful and envying those who died <laughs> yeah well, if you get if you get hit by a fireball there's probably some good reason for that like if you live longer maybe you uh, would fall away from the faith that's yeah, the right time yeah. for you to die yeah. so yeah. you got to accept that too like it, it's a good thing to be hit by the fireball right then yeah yeah <laughs> this is kind of my broader point it's like i mean 
we all know there's no one gets out alive uh people out there and so it, it, it doesn't really matter if you get out of this life not alive by the by receiving your general judgment and your particular judgment at the same time the only way to do so is to be one of the people alive at, at the end times or you're like most of humanity who is you know, gone, gone up to a particular judgment first, and then waits as a disembodied spirit, either in heaven, purgatory, or hell, um, without your body and without many of your memories for the general judgment, whenever that should come to pass, but they're chronologically separated. Um, it doesn't really matter, but it is interesting to speculate about because the church is in a state of the, the bishops together with the Pope is in the state of sort of undeclared apostasy and has been so for about 60 years and has contradicted a lot of her her doctrines. I'm just saying, man, the Marian apparitions are literally being silenced by the church itself. And um, I always turn to, to, you know, the Marian apparitions when it comes to, and Cardinal Burke seems to as well. So I don't know, each of you guys want to take a, a closing parting, parting uh, shot or something. Mike, you haven't said anything in a while. No, the only thing I'm just sitting here listening and soaking it in because I'm I'm usually the guy to kind of turn away from the end times conversation because I, I remember as a Protestant, I had all these books on eschatology and I was reading it and you kind of, it really draws you away from the faith in a really profound way that you don't actually realize. And you're like, oh, I actually haven't like focused on Christ or my prayer life because I'm so focused on when uh, things are going to go to crap. But uh, I have to say, I mean, no parting shot besides this is the most compelling case for us being in this specific time period uh, as a direct result of what's happening in the church it's a sad state um pray for the church pray for francis but ultimately pray for god's will to be done because it's 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 all providence really at the end of the day too so that's great great stuff tim and you guys great great horrible terrifying like pants wedding stuff <laughs> what, what do you say well so I think some people listening to him will be wondering why, on the one hand, you can acknowledge so many of the same concerns that do make people become set of accountists, and yet you're not one. Like, in a nutshell, what would the reason be? Because a lot of people who are seeds will listen to you thinking, yep, 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 all of that, all of that, all of that, all of that, and now make the last move. Like, join us. Uh, the main reason I'm not a set of accountists is because of the um, the visibility component of the church, right? The church has these four marks. It's got to be one holy Catholic and apostolic. And in the um, um, Catholicity requirement, there's there's a visibility requirement, meaning there won't be like a, a Gnostic church. The church might have to go underground again, the way it, it was underground for the first three centuries until Constantine um, kind of liberated it and enabled us to come up into the sunlight, so to speak. But um, yeah, it, it's it's simply not compelling. It's not impossible the way the Sede Vicantis argue, hey, well, the church is still, those with eyes to see still can see the visible church. It's the whatever, SSPV or 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 more extreme. You know, you have to be either SSPV or more extreme to be counted as part of the church. I guess that's visibility, which is why I don't say um, they're they're philosophically incoherent. They're not contradicting themselves. I just find it um, an uncompelling view. I don't find the set of contests um, presentation of their case for why they satisfy the conditions for the possibility of visibility to be um, compelling. You know, over fifty percent or anywhere near fifty percent. It's it's not that visible because the church is not just a church of scholars and people that take a really deep look into things. Usually scholars don't even look deeply into things. We were kind of talking about this before we roll tape. Um, so the, the church has to be sufficiently visible for all the dolts out there who's, you know, 90 to 99% of people. So it, it just, it would be dooming everyone if only people that were sufficiently interested to look, um, did look and were like, oh, the set of the contest church, you know, the pre-1958 church is the real church. That just, that that sounds to my ears, it, it doesn't pass the smell test. It sounds far too sectarian. So I think a more compelling case is, yeah, uh, not that the sedes are wrong, that the church has been in low, low key apostasy since John the 23rd um, took the chair in 1958, but rather, or 59, whatever it is, and the Vatican, Second Vatican Council was 
really close to being uh, erroneous, but rather um, that's that's a correct observation. Kind of like we say the red pill has the correct um, diagnosis of the malady, but they don't have the correct diagnosis of the remedy. I say, yeah, um, correct diagnosis. The church has been in this low key apostasy since around John the 23rd slash Vatican II. But the prognosis isn't that, therefore, there's this crypto-secret church. The prognosis is rather that it's probably, so, that was probably the beginning of the onset of end times. And, and end times can be the way heaven counts it, as I understand it, you know, a century or two centuries long. So th this began then. Also, Sister Lucy said at Fatima, by the way, that the attack on the family would be the final, Mary told her directly, it would be the final attack on the world in the 12th hour and the, the, the attack on the family is now formalized whereas you couldn't say that you know in rome or corinth or anything with with the you know the, the skittle stuff the transformer stuff the, the 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 preponderance of feminism i just think that that's another really really strong tell so mm -hmm. then in the spirit of father elijah you could say that what c-mask does what Will and Mike do with coaching what you do with your books and what we're doing with Huawei is somewhat of a forestalling of the end times. Then, not to be like solipsistic or whatever, but Maybe. if that is if that is the final battle <laughs> and 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 like we do move the needle, then you know maybe we buy ourselves like six months. Well, the, the way you know the film Hacksaw Ridge, when yeah. he's just praise Lord, help me get one more, just one more, and it's like just if it more. gets if it gets really dark and all you can do is fight in the shade. Then you can just learn to love it and just sit there sniping like one more family, feminism gone, one more feminism gone. Yep. Just slowly working away as far behind the enemy lines as you are, because that's a good use of your time. And while there's life, there's always hope. There's always still some souls to save. So why not use your time to do that? Seems like a noble way to go down. Tim, yeah, would you that, agree with my great summary analogy. of your um of your set of, I'm dyslexic. I always say set of Cavantist, but it's set of set of Vacantist. Um, uh, that I'm hearing you say that the the test for the faithful is sin, not the church. God's not trying to juke you out with like theological literacy or like historical literacy. The test for the faithful is like be holy. <clears throat> Is that sure. a fair summary of what you're saying? Yeah, but but that the the test for the apocalypse is some sort of ecclesial measure. Right? I mean, that, oh, I that wasn't even be... talking about the apocalypse. I was literally just saying, oh. like, my what I heard you say about why set of acantism is doesn't pass the smell test is because God's not interesting and in interested in trying to juke us out with the Catholic Church. He, the test that He puts us to is like. Holiness, oh, like yeah. be a good, be a good person. Yeah, keep my commandments. Right, you not know, like my commandments. Read, and read. read books and and like watch. Well, the, the that's faith, like podcasts. Right. Yeah. If <laughs> if faith consists mainly in the submission of the intellect to the teaching authority of the church, as Aquinas says, then the set of vacantism is really interesting because what you, you what you end up with ultimately is. Like as far as I can see, it's like Protestantism, where you just have um, special boys who read lots of books and then kind of stick their finger in the air and decide when they think the last real pope was, and they can't agree. Some of them think it was back in 1130, and there's no real authority to decide between them. And once you hear that mess of opinions just clashing against each other and no one has the final say, well, guess what that sounds like? James White Christ, and buddies, yeah. and you're not even allowed to join the gang unless you've read 50 different books that normal people don't give a shit about. So for Tim's reason, like the smell test, it's there and it, it fails it. Yeah, you're just a different only version reason. of Protestant. Yeah, imagine but, imagine you have to be like a well-read Peter Diamond to be a set of accountants. It's like, we're all going to hell then. <laughs> it's just <laughs> one way ticket. That's what well I was saying. Just sign up, dude. <laughs> yeah, like... like <laughs> that, that guy's smart and that guy's sharp, but yeah, I, I agree with that. But the reason I've been not really pushing back, but the reason I, I against you guys so much, but stipulating so hard and pushing back against 
anybody, you know, like the Trent Trentonius horns out there that are saying things like, oh, you're a Protestant if you're if you kind of hold the line at all or look at Francis or the post conciliar church at all is because, um, I mean, I don't know, go read the Francis interview with um, Eugenio Scalfer. You, you can't have a pope who is Arius, right? Arius can't be your pope. You can't have a pope that's saying Jesus wasn't part of the Trinity while well, he was alive. And there are only two. Um, this is not like, oh, well, if you reason about this a priori at all, you become a Protestant. It's, it's really not speculation. It's just modally speaking, a priori, there are only two, given what we know about ecclesiology and, ma you know, the magisterium of the church being, being inerrant, there are only two options. Once you have a pope who says Jesus isn't part of the Trinity or, you know, you know, mortal sinners don't have to go to confession, they can go receive communion, which is in, you know, Amoris Laetitia, the 2016 um, post-apostolic exhortation. There are only two options. The two options are, this is a sui generis thing, this is end times, this is a, a formal apostasy from, from the tippy top. And, and of course, Mary was saying this all throughout the 20th century, which I believe. Or pretty much the set of a contest have to be right. If it's not the end of the world, then the set is have to be right. And, um, and you know, the, well, that just can't be the Pope. And, you know, John Paul II kissing the Quran and, and saying, you know, Vatican II was a new Pentecost, a new birthday of the church. The, 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 well, that wasn't a Pope. So I'm saying I choose to lean into a kind of hermeneutic of apocalypsis because I don't, because I think one, it's more likely than set of agonism, but because I think it pretty much has to be one of two once you're confronted with um, uh, something like Francis's pontificate and the things that he said over the last 11 years. You can use con contraception, he said, um, in February of 2016 uh, in the face of the Zika virus. Uh, I mean, just, and so people have, have elected to sort of close, not not you guys, but but the the Trent Horns and the Catholic answer types and the Pope Splinter types out there have chosen to just not look at it and not look at the monster under their bed or in their closet. And they're like, well, what are you talking about? I didn't hear him say that. Well, well he said it, you know? It, you know, if the tree falls in the woods and you didn't hear it, it still fell. And Francis is still saying all this stuff just, you know, two weeks ago. The Vatican went away from marking uh, the year of our Lord is the year of our Lord, and now it's called the Common Era. That, that's that's really big to decentralize Christ as the central figure of history. That's that's not nothing. And so you have Pope explainers out there that are like, "Well, that's not nothing." Well, that's nothing. It's really not. It it's not nothing. You have a Vatican that is saying Christ is historically speaking not the center of history, um, and they're trying to trying to Nick. You always say revelation of the method. They're trying to reveal the method. They're trying to make it public. That's why they, they know it'll be a big deal if they suddenly move to BCE and CE instead of AD and BC. I, I think I think um, you don't actually have to be like spurg out like Peter Diamond to see that something's really wrong. I also don't think he has the correct um, interpretation. But it, I mean, people have said, hey, Tim, why don't you debate Peter Diamond? You know, uh, people tell me I'm one of the only guys that could do it. It's like, well, I think we're just going to be disagreeing as to a hermeneutic. At the end of the day, I think it's end times rather than sedes. But so I guess that's my closing shot is I don't see a third option. I, uh, not judging by sin, but judging by the, the state of the church as I've watched it very closely over the last 10 to 15 years. The church can't be in this condition and just us have a bunch of pontificates like the Francis pontificate after it. It's either this is the last one and Francis is Pope or he's not Pope. So I don't know if anyone wanted to respond to that, but that's, I, I'm judging based on Frank. For me, Francis is really central to a lot of this stuff and what's what's been going on in the church. If you, if you look at it with any kind of um, close scrutiny, it just can't be happening. It's not like, misbehaving Borgia Popes. It is absolutely unique. And no, I'm not going to become a sede. I'm just like, okay, I'm expecting any any day, Lord, you know, any week, any month, maybe any year for things to be wrapping up and stuff like COVID, uh, you know, beer bug, all that, that only 
that that's looking like a new world order and it, it's all looking to be of a piece to me that's why i'm i guess i was willing to engage in the speculation and a holy guy one of the holiest prelates in the church is burke and if he's not above the speculation i'm like okay i'll, I'll get down on all fours and, and begin to do this um an eschatology game, which which is a famously, as as Mike's pointed out, lots a famously uh, attractive nuisance. That's that has, um, like the mirror of Arius said, you know, so many people wasted their lives in front of the mirror. People do this with eschatology. I'm not suggesting you guys out there do that. I'm just saying, okay, it came up. One of the holiest guys in the church, kind of the leader of the church, is is Cardinal Burke, because certainly not Francis. Uh, he said it, so I'm willing to. Pay heed. But I, I guess uh, yeah, everyone's everyone's taking the parting shot. So um, thanks a lot. We should we should um, just plug really fast uh, patriarchy.com, uh, which we were talking about this morning. Uh, well, did you want to say something about that in closing? Uh, I just wanted to add that uh, St. Francis de Sales talks about how we shouldn't do anything that disturbs our spiritual peace. And I can imagine some people after today's show feeling that their spiritual peace is disturbed and starting to panic about stuff. You don't need to. And there's a really good commentary on Psalm 104 from St. Augustine, which goes like this. Um, Let therefore this man, he's talking about the righteous man, work good works in the security of the peace of the church. Let him work unto the end, right? Not five minutes to midnight, unto the end. For some time there will be a sort of general darkening. And a sort of assault will be made, but in the evening, that is in the end of the world. And maybe it's now, right? Tim's given plenty of reasons why it might be. Uh, but now the church does work in peace and tranquility, for man shall go forth to his work and to his labor unto the evening, right? Unto the evening, right until midnight. You don't just panic and stop what you're doing at five minutes to midnight. You go right until the end. So I think that's the best outlook to have on it. And in the spirit of that, yeah, we've got a um, new project coming up. It's really something that I've been working on for a while now. And it's patriarchy.com. So it's like an umbrella for a lot of the different work that we're doing in many different areas. So say more about that soon, but that's the new thing coming up which I think is just going to keep focused on individual men and families and having the biggest impact we can in the area where it matters most, because that's the final battle, as we talked about a few times today. Thanks, yeah, in the spirit yeah. of also going down swinging too, uh, it's, I'm, I'm very honored to be part of uh, patriarchy.com and what you're doing. Uh, work with with the kind of work that you're doing well it's it's needed and also um i don't think i've spoken about it on the podcast yet but the catholic masculinity project which tim you'll be speaking at next week's meeting a thursday will we're going to arrange a meeting elliot hulse is confirmed for the 26th as well so it's an online men's community there's a free community and an inner circle paid community all about faith fellowship and fortitude because there's a strong lack of brotherhood especially in the catholic space something that the protestants have uh really down pat where our 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 faith our circle is rife with the uh, uh, pancake breakfast boomer type of men's groups that's not edifying or really helping sharpen anybody. So if you're a guy needing fellowship, which you are, join the the Catholic Masculinity Project, either the free community or the inner circle, or we we, we go a lot more in depth. So and thank you guys for also your guys' support in that front as well. Yeah, I'll 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 um I'll re record my little spot and send that to you today, Mike. Uh, by the way, oh, thank folks you. out there. I do have the the leave and cleave book uh, now that that just came out uh, two days ago. This is available on. This is a, a not for resale copy, but this is a hard cover that came out September the 11th. As uh, was me and Steph's um, how to do patriarchy and nine lessons, the nine chapters of this book class, which started on Wednesday. But you you can catch up because we record all the sessions. So uh, go to timothyjgordon.com to order a signed copy of the book or the class, just, just um, go to classes and hit the one flesh marital workshop. You can also get the book on behemoth Amazon, but you can't get a signed copy there. So um, thanks, Nick. Did you want to plug anything, man? Uh, yeah. What a woman is, is uh, plugging along um, editing the trailer, uh, which has to come out before the movie, obviously. So I have to edit that first. Um, so I'm really getting into all the footage. Very exciting. Um, 
Tim just interviewed Father Ripperger. That was a really great interview. I recommend everybody go listen to it. He's in the movie as well, talking about a lot of the same things, a lot of things that you you don't hear from um, Catholic priests on the subject today. He's basically the only Catholic priest who does address the subject honestly. So uh, it's been he's really also cool just story. really, really nice, which is what you told yeah. me after you met him in person, Nick. And I was like, yeah, it is weird because people say that when they meet like Will or me or Mike or you like, wow, like these, those guys are actually really nice, even though they seem intense. I'm like, so it's, it's dumb that I'm like surprised, like a normie to me, but father Chad is just so, so nice and personable and looking to agree. It's just really refreshing. Um, yeah. Only in, yeah, totally. intellectually insecure guys are looking to disagree when, when you mostly agree. And, and he, he was like, he's like one of us. He's one of the good ones. Totally is. Totally is. So, uh, yeah, that's coming soon. Good show guys. Uh, yeah, good show. I'll just say well, there's an interview. There's a section in that interview that I did with them a couple of days ago where he he officially vindicates the um, the pro uh, uh, well, I guess the pro Megha side of the diaper gate issue, and I'm going to be clipping <laughs> yeah. that and releasing yeah, that. Yeah, Maybe yeah. doing a show only on that. That was very vindicating for me and us and uh, Megha, who's also in Wawi. Yeah. All right. God bless you all. Uh, thank you guys. The long episode, I think a good one, substantive one. I hope, I hope everyone liked it. Like Will said, always listen to Will's uh, um, last message. It, you know, don't, don't blackpill. God bless you all. Don't be a doomer guys. God bless. God don't bless. be a doomer. <laughs>